are moments where I think everyone questions, why am I here? What am I doing? The what is easy to see. You can look at the actions you've taken. You can look at the results that you're getting. That's the what of your life. But sometimes it can feel pretty empty and it can feel pretty meaningless. To help us reclaim or regain or put in the meaning in our life, Join me, we're gonna be talking with Shadid and he's gonna help us understand the why behind the what of your life. So please help me welcome into the studio, Mr. Shadid. All right, there you are, poof, it's magic. Great to be here, great to be here. I am so excited to see you. Likewise, likewise. So Shadi, thank you so much for making the time to come on the Suicide Prevention Show. You have such a unique perspective on the world and I just can't wait for everybody to get to know you the way that I did. Oh, well, the, the interesting thing about your platform and your message is that what I do, we get to apply it to a, a different lens and talk more about purpose and meaning and step behind beyond the the what, the, the titles, and, and the day-to-day -day mechanical discussions that we often have and, and get deeper into the, the essence of humanity as it relates to our gifts, talents, and skills. All right, the essence of humanity as it relates to our gifts, talents, and skills. I love that. All right, so gifts, talents, and skills. I like acronyms, so I'm going gets. That's a gets for me. GTS, gifts, talents, and skills. When it comes to gifts, talents, and skills, these are all things that we can see. When it comes to why we might want to develop them, that's invisible. So as, as we go down this journey together, Shadid, when did you figure out the why behind your what? Great question. Now, for me, a lot of my gifts, talents, and skills were developed early on in that I was born into a family of creators. So no matter if um, members of my family went to work during the day, the mentality was that when we come home, we, we do for self, we build for self, and we build amongst each other. So that cohesiveness, as far as we talk about business partners, so on and so forth, I work within my family for the first uh, 17 years of my life. And the lessons that I learned from that in terms of, let's say, where I fit in in the, the overall hierarchy, I was blessed with the opportunity to know exactly what I wanted to do and also the value of hard work because you, you don't work uh, you work the hardest when you're working um, with passion involved and, and with love involved. And when you work with family, that that love is is kind of it, it bleeds through into your work. So, um, so you're going to have to pause and you're going to have to unpack that and take us back to your childhood because you're using some language that I'm not sure I understand what it means. When you say they went off to work and then they came home and they came home and they built for themselves, what is that? Well, we all have what we do to pay the bills. And we also have the, the passion that, that drives us. So let's say, for example, if my- oh, Wait, oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me about your family. Take me back to when you were 15 and tell me the story of a 15 year old day. Well, 15 year old day is waking up, going to school, coming from school and working within a uh, family business or during the summertime, waking up and going into the store and working next to family in, in a number of different ways. So what kind of store? I want you to take me there. When you walked into the store, what did you see? Who were the kinds of people you talked to? Well, the, the kinds of people that I would talk to are everyday uh, men and women from uh, postal workers to bankers, people who would come into our store and, and see our family in action. Now, 
everyone from grandma who would make the pies and cakes to my uncle who would run the uh, register to my cousin who uh, did the delivery. So everyone had their, their, their place in the overall machine. And that was a, a great way for me to see how your gifts and talents could be applied to a bigger picture in, in, a, in a subtle way, thinking beyond myself and not being uh, selfish in always giving towards a greater good. Cool. Okay, so now I understand. Your family owned a baked goods store. Um, so your mom, your grandmother did the baking. That's what I heard. Yes. Your uncle ran the register. Your cousin did the deliveries. So what kind of store would you call it if, it's, if I don't have the right label? Well, it, specifically, um, my Philly cheesesteak restaurant with, so the, 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 the novelty is that my family um, came from the Philadelphia area. My uncle retired from the army. Now, in our family, if someone is starting a new business or venture, Many of us will move for a few months, three to six months to help them get the idea off the ground. So when he retired from the army, we all converged on Radcliffe, Kentucky, which is in the Guinness <laughs> Book of World Records for the Dixie Highway for the most amount of restaurants in, let's say, one uh, square uh, capita, so one area. So in a, a place where... There are more restaurants than any place in the world. Guinness Book of World Records. We decided that our restaurant was unique. So us coming together um, with the, let's say the restaurant itself being taking a Philadelphia delicacy and bringing it to a place where, you know, you don't normally have Philly cheesesteaks and adding in different sides and recipes uh, helped us to uh, stand out. So um, one lesson from that was that if you are able to find your why, in our case, it was family, it was our unique recipe and blend, uh, that will allow you to power through the what, which is there's a thousand other restaurants that are within your area. Why do we have to come to you? That's really, really cool. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That gives me a whole different perspective. When you say a family of creators, now I know what a family of creators looks like. What a cool thing that when somebody got something new going on, the family came together to get it started. So what happened when you, you know, that was summers. What happened when you went back to school and graduated from high school? Well, that goes into the, the next lesson, which is no matter where you go, there you are. So I went very far away from Radcliffe, Kentucky. I went to Japan. I joined the United States Navy. And within that environment where you're far from home, you're lonely, you're questioning everything you've learned, have been taught because there's this rigid structure that you're being introduced to which uh, indoctrinates you in order to help you be a part of completing a mission. And so in my case, because I was raised in a structure where everyone played their position to contribute to the uh, greater good, I was able to fit in rather quickly. Now, of course, there's loneliness, there's questioning who you are in this, this grand scheme of things, but what it taught me was some of the, the, the lessons that I rejected when around, I don't want to wake up and do this. Why do I have to be the person who takes out the trash or wastes the tables or has to clean up uh, morning, noon, night? Why are we working so long? Those lessons became fuel for me as I, on a surface level, when I was going through it with family, I now understood the importance of it when I entered in and stayed within the, uh, the military structure. So when I was able to come back to family, it gave me a greater appreciation for that, which I was raised in also that of which I am. 
So that of which I am, we're going to get to know you pretty well, I have a feeling. Shadid, how long did you serve in the military? A total of six years. Long enough to make a huge difference in the world. So thank you for that. My pleasure. I, I understand the family sacrifice that that takes because I'm an army brat. And I've got multiple you know, siblings and nieces and nephews. I mean, you know, we're a military family in a lot of ways. So this is, um, I'm like going, I feel like I got dropped into the twilight zone. Do, 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 do. Yeah, be, because my family was sort of the wild west compared to yours. And I'm listening to this story of what it must have been like to be a teenager. And I love that. Why do I have to get up early in the morning and take out the trash? That's a universal teenage um, place that, that most, I think, if not all, but most teenagers go to when it comes to having responsibilities within the family. Absolutely. You know? It's just a normal, normal place. If you could say one thing to a teenager today that would help them get this lesson sooner, what would you tell them? Play your position and contribute to the greater good. At this point in time, you don't have the, the freedom to experience life how your brain tells you you want to experience it and you have to bloom where you're planted. And if your position is to contribute by helping to take out the trash or washing the dishes, these, this will teach you the lessons that you need in order to have your own definition of what you want life to be someday. At this point in time, you don't see the big picture. You only see what's in front of you and you may not like the task, but the task is the lesson which allows you to create for your own when the time is right. I'm thinking back to uh, raising my teens and thinking back to when I was a teen and I'm going, wah, 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 wah. All right, tell, tell, let's tell them why. Let's go to your favorite thing, why. So play your position and contribute to the greater good so that what, Shadid? What can you, can you put this in the language of a teenager so that what, what do you think that, what do you remember that you really wanted back then? Well, what I wanted was the opportunity to experience freedom on my terms. So at that time, it may have been a car. At that time, I thought that having, uh, let's say a good paying job was uh, my definition of freedom but I did not know how to get there. And even worse, the people who were in position to help me were authority figures. And taking advice from an authority figure is the worst thing for a teenager to do. But what teenagers have to understand is that there are bridges in life, that if you're on one side of the island and you need to get to the other, you need a bridge to help you get there. And so if you don't like authority, you need to understand that you need the, the bridge in order to get there. So the people in your life are there for a reason and they're there to help you to get to where you want to go. So the so that that you need to keep in mind is so that you can build a bridge to get you from where you are to where you want to be and people are there to get you where you want to be. I love it. Uh, what I heard you say, and I may have misheard you, but I heard you say that taking advice from an authority figure is the worst thing a teenager can do. And I'm like, oh my God, every teacher, every parent is going, no, I want them to take my advice. How else am I supposed to help my kids? So now you're gonna have to talk to, the, to those of us that are parents that think giving advice to teens is the best thing for them? Well, for parents, your parents, teachers, authority figures, what you have to realize is that kids, teenagers are more intelligent than you realize. Kids and teenagers have more access to information than at any other point 
in recorded human history. So they have many of the answers at the tip of, of their fingers, literally in, in their phones. So they have access to information. The main value that you can give your children, your youth, whether in your family or within your community is the power of example. So you may say to do this, but your lifestyle, your decisions and how you carry yourself speaks volumes to that child and they follow examples, not advice. So if you want to guide a child the right way or, or in a way that you feel will help them, let's say, reduce many of the mistakes that you may have made or help them go on a path that will support what their skills or their ambition level may uh, dictate your example in how you deal with your own life and also how you follow through, how you keep your word, how you keep your promises are what they tune into the most. That's the antenna that, that guides them. And sometimes the people who, uh, let's say, uh, speak softly or not at all, but lead an example, that's the antenna that they follow. Or that's the signal that they tend to follow. So keep that in mind. I love that. I love that. I mean, we've been told this over and over again that, you know, children model what we do, not what we say. Uh, however, that doesn't stop us from trying to guide our kids by giving them advice. So that was beautifully said. And I get a big aha for me. I just got an idea for my business. Thank you very much. And my business now is, and you may not know this, but my business now is the directorship of the Teen Suicide Prevention Society. I still own Success Journey Academy, and I still teach emotional resilience mastery. But my focus, the majority of my time, is now in the nonprofit teaching teens how to suicide proof their friends. Wow. Powerful yeah, that, work. That's, that's a, a, a new venture for me. I am going into the land of, uh, I, I don't even know what to call this land, but the reality is I swore I would never, ever, ever go back to working with teens after I raised my own. And now I'm going back to working with teens. And so it's like, ah. so I'm a little bit on the nervous side. So some of the questions I'm asking you have a lot to do with what I'm up to. And I just hope that the audience gets some benefit from them. <laughs> what, hey, everybody, just full disclaimer, this is a personal coaching session with Shadid for Jackie, and you just get to be a voyeur. But if you want to address something specific with Shadid, feel free to put it in the chat, put it in the comments. If you're part of the very inspiring persons group, you can put it into that Facebook group because that's where you get to interact with people like Shadid and get some feedback. All right. So feedback, your family gave you this perspective of everybody showed up. I mean, if there's something I'm taking away from this, it's that what you learned in your family was that family shows up. For what a great worse. lesson. For better or worse. It's in, in, there's no perfect family and Every family has its ups and downs and its struggles, but our code of conduct and code of ethics, if you were to interview different members of my family in separate rooms, many of us would echo the same sentiments. And I feel that's so important, whether in life, in business, is that we must operate with a defined code of ethics, uh, a defined code of conduct on how we handle ourselves in just about every scenario or situation. It makes things so much easier in terms of life, in terms of business, in terms of following our passion. And when we talk about uh, finding or defining our why, it all comes from what you stand for and also what your non-negotiables or what you're not willing to stand for. There we go. What you're not willing to stand for is a really good thing to know. You know, it's, it, it really does simplify decision-making. You know, things become automatic no's. And for anybody who struggles to say no to things, 
I think that this idea of understanding what your personal code of ethics, what your personal code of conduct is, will make it easier to say no to things that are not in alignment, that don't match up with your personal code of ethics and personal code of conduct. I love those two frames. Now, where do you want to take this? Because I could deep dive with you into code of ethics and code of conduct, but why? Keep coming back up. Yes, we can dive deeper into uh, purpose-driven living because when we talk about, uh, let's say, suicide prevention, when we talk about uh, suicide awareness, purpose, our why become very, very, very essential, especially when we talk about being a comfort or being a friend, being a family member of someone who is questioning why they need to uh, continue forward, why their work is valuable, why their self-esteem is validated. And so the why all is, is, is part of that, that tapestry that um, is kind of interwoven into who we are, our spirit, and why we're here. You know, that's a, a really valid point. I mean, at the Teen Suicide Prevention Society, we're focused on pure prevention. So we don't look to work with people who are struggling with suicidal thinking. We help them find intervention, trained intervention specialists. But the why stays the same. When I met with a group of teenagers at the local high school and I shared with them the mission, I went around the room. I said, "You, know, hey, after I shared everything, I said, hey, do you have a story? Do you have a friend who's tried or died? And she did. They went one after the other. One young lady said she lost her first friend to suicide in elementary school. Wow. And her second friend just last year. And so if there's a why for teens to come into the Teen Talk program, it would be, I don't want to lose another friend. I think that would be the why. That's who I'm hoping will show up and become trained as a teen talker and learn the script is not so that they have to worry about their friends, but so that they don't have to worry about their friends. Because when I left that high school, I sat in my car and I cried. It wasn't most of the kids in the room, Shadi. It was 100% of the kids in the room had a story of a friend who tried or died. And I'll bet their parents are just as clueless as I was. You know, it, so that's my why. I don't want any other parent to get blindsided the way that I was back in 95 when my daughter Stephanie at 14 tried to take her own life. I don't want anybody else to have to live through that. And I think for the teens, the power of knowing their why, that they just don't want to risk losing another friend. And we risk that by staying silent. Exactly. And what, what is fascinating about prevention and awareness is when we start to realize that many people are able to articulate their let's say, struggle with suicide after it has happened. But the question becomes, during the storm, how can we help people to identify and articulate? And when people are going through the storm, it takes someone who is present, who is aware and can identify the the signs. And in many cases, the root, the, 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 the root, of when things start to um, go in a, 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 let's say a negative direction is when that why becomes questioned. It could be through a a scenario of trauma. It could be um, mental health challenges. It it could be a a change in uh, family dynamics, divorce, or, you know, other scenarios. And when that affects the the self-esteem or the why, if, Someone isn't there, a a concerned friend, family member, parent, community leader, coach, teacher, then 
we we start to see um, many of the um, the unfortunate cases of suicide that that begin to occur. You know what's really interesting about what you just said is that all of those things, when someone starts to struggle with their self-esteem, when someone's been bullied, they have a trauma, we, 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 here's what we've found. You can't tell by looking. There's no way to identify when that's happening inside someone's head. And because we don't wanna worry people in our lives, we don't want the stigma associated with reaching out for help, we don't want the consequences of people finding out. We don't talk about it. We try not to think about it. And what happens then is that's like me trying telling you, hey, Shadi, don't think about an elephant. You know, what just happens? You think about an elephant. So the more they struggle with not thinking about it, they double down on it. And their subconscious mind pays attention to that because it thinks that what you're thinking about is what you want to bring about. And I call it the negative echo chamber. What we're working with with the teens is to assume we're all at risk. I call it the suicide war, war with two A's. We're all at risk. So if you just assume that everybody's at risk, you have the talk with them. You ask them to practice, to let you practice your script with them, because that's all we're asking about. We're not saying, I think you've got a problem. I want to talk to you about suicide. That's the approach that doesn't work because we're so good at masking. What does work, we found, is to invite them to help you practice something, because then they're helping you. And whether they were struggling with suicidal thoughts or not struggling with suicidal thoughts, either way, you're going to back them away from the edge. You know, it creates a buffer. And they may not have even known they were near it. And we had to take that approach because everything else that was out there is it called suicide prevention. But Shadid, it's intervention. It doesn't kick in until somebody's got a known risk factor or they've had a previous attempt. So that's why this is so near and dear to my heart is that we've got to get ahead of this curve because waiting until there's a sign is really looking for trouble. That's an excellent point in that part of awareness is not necessarily uh, looking for the negative signs, but it's also affirming, uh, let's say, healthy qualities and patterns as well. Simply engaging in having programs and having, let's say, opportunities for uh, youth especially to connect through interaction, it, it will identify certain patterns where things need to be strengthened versus once an, an attempt has happened, then we, we are in a different area. We can stay in the area of awareness, engagement, encouragement, connecting, communicating. That, uh, that That's all prevention in my book. If we're connecting and communicating, we, we have already prevented the problem. Yes. Because we've prevented the silence. Exactly. Yeah, I exactly. love that. All right, so we're back on purpose-driven living because that is certainly changed my world in the last year to know what my purpose is in the world. When did you discover your purpose? When I was, I, I read a book when I was uh, 17, uh, Dr. Robert Anthony's Advanced Formula for Success. I got this book, I obtained this book for less than $5 at a very old uh, bookstore. And what this book taught me was that you success is as simple as uh, one plus one equals two. So just like a, a math formula. And so previous to that, I thought that most of life was not in my control or I was trying very hard for, let's say a minimal uh, result. And so I knew at that time that my purpose would be, um, uh, let's say business, but specifically uh, helping people uh, reach their potential. So 
at my uncle's uh, home, there was there was a working man, so someone who would uh, you know spray outside for ants and termites, so on and so forth. And what I realized was that just because you uh, see something in someone, it may be unsolicited advice. So imagine me, young young Shadi, and I have this this fire from reading this book and writing out my success plan. This is what I want to do with the next 10 years of my life at 17. And I, I'm, I'm going around telling people, not asking, consulting, or you know, asking for their permission, telling people that they uh, should be doing, this is not your calling. And <laughs> it, it didn't go well at first. And so, but I knew that anything that I would do during the day, even joining the military. I, I felt that was a means to an end to you know, expand my network, get a, a greater worldview, some new experiences that would aid me in my ultimate journey of helping people go from where they are to where, where they want to be. All right. So helping people go from where they are to where they want to be is what you do. That is your purpose in the world. One way or the other. Yes. One way or the other. All right. So how does that show up when somebody is um, not sure where they want to go or they don't believe that they can go anywhere? Because I'm well, seeing a lot of that in the world right now where people are buying into a belief system of the, you know, their BS is that they don't believe they can go anywhere, that they're stuck where they are. Yes. I'll give you an example. So I have a way of getting people to pinpoint exactly why they are here on earth and that their path that they're currently on is 1000% not coincidental or accidental. So in one case, I have a, a, a dear client who is a women's weightlifting coach based on the uh, West Coast of the United States. Now, she was focused on the what and get women in shape, help them define the, the best version of themselves. But when we dove into her story, what we realized is that she was the fourth generation of um, Norwegian women's uh, health practitioners. Her mom's a doctor. And if you go back generations, um, there's this medical helping history that is part of her family tree. And her interpretation of that is through health and fitness, if you consider health to be a form of medicine and fitness to be a form of wellness, she's continuing along that path. So once she realized that, then we tied in the, the, the Norwegian, uh, let's say value system. And it became this is very interesting path of, well, wait a minute. Uh, when I was 12, this happened to me. And when I was 21, this happened. And so we connected the dots. And so now her entire business change to instead of let me get you in shape i am the fourth generation of uh, culture values wisdom and it actually strengthened the connection with mom with grandma with great grandma and help to because it's, it's an overall uh, as i mentioned tapestry it's, it's a web of heritage culture experience and so now when the day-to-day -day troubles of, I don't want to send the email or I don't want to do this in my business, it's I'm continuing a legacy that was established before me and through the expression of my gifts and talents, I'm helping to fulfill my family's destiny. And that is a big difference between the why versus the what. Got it. That's a, that's a really wonderful story and a great example of the power of knowing your why, because all of a sudden it's not about her little practice or her business that she's trying to establish. 
it's about a legacy that she can share from that place of power. Yeah, that's a pretty powerful legacy um, to, to bring into the world. So I love this idea. What I'm taking away is that your story, your history has your why in it somewhere. Your, your history is, is written by a very powerful hand and a very powerful pen. And in the, the previous example that I gave, can you imagine going 31 years of your life without realizing that you have this, this, this connection to a, a, a greater source that has existed your entire life? So what I help for talented men and women to do is to remember to remember your story, the ups, the downs, it, it all is connects for the greater good. And when you, you go and you think about why do I do this? Why do I do what I do? The, the history behind it, when you connect with it and you understand it on a, a deeper level, then you'll realize that within your family tree, there are people who have been practicing a variation of what you do and you're just the expression of that in nine out of 10 cases. I am laughing because you said, can you imagine 31 years of not knowing? Oh, no, Shanita, I can't imagine 31 years of not knowing. I can tell you about 59 years of not knowing. Because for 59 years, my whole life growing up and my business life, growing into my business life, my why had no story, it had no roots. And now it does because I can sort of make sense of my journey under the lens of what I'm doing now with the Teen Suicide Prevention Society. This is such an interesting thing because what you're saying is that everyone has a why that is the clues of which can be found if they give themselves permission to look at the story. But Shadid, we tell ourselves stories all the time and not all of them are true. Uh oh, yeah, well, when we talk about the who we are today, we're nothing more than a collection of stories, some of which are part of our uh, the 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 architect of who we are, and the other are based on uh, let's say uh, lies that we've told ourselves that we've begun to believe. And so when we that is the importance of understanding your history, your family tree, your the events that have happened to you and taking the time to unplug from the you know numerous distractions that we have in the world and, and going within and connecting to the essence of who we are because once we understand that that family tree and that story, then we're able to, interpret what is happening in our lives in a different way. I'll give you an example. So we've had uh, many conversations and we're part of, um, you know, many communities together. But the fact that before uh, I came on to this interview that um, your daughter is a member of your team tells me more about who you are and what you stand for in your mission than anything else you could have told me about the why, the mission, the org chart, the business plan, that speaks volumes. And what people don't understand is that they have people, they have a story that speaks volumes about them through their substance than anything that they can make up or pay someone to uh, architect and design for them. If someone is struggling with this idea of um, story shame, that they, what they believe about their story 
fills them with discomfort, what would you say to them? When you fully embrace your imperfections, your flaws, and the dark parts of your journey, it gives you power because you're able to take the whole picture and accept it for what it is, who the people who contributed to that story, where their flaws may lie, and understand how those people, how those circumstances, and how that total reality has helped to fuel the person that you are today. When you embrace the good, the bad, and the ugly, it, you draw a strength from it because you realize that every circumstance gives you power to continue forward with a greater understanding of where you've been. All right, so we're gonna connect the dots for people because you have an amazing gift that you have offered to all of the attendees of our show. And I want you to help them connect the dots because this is a digital access, assets execution plan. And so on the surface, it appears to be all about business. What's the real bottom line of the benefit of somebody going through this exercise with you, this gift that you are giving them? What will they take away from it? The ability to create is the most important skill set that you can have to liberate yourself from the distractions, the time for money trap, and begin to free up your time to discover who you really are and why you were put on this planet and what your mission is. Beginning to create by packaging your knowledge into digital products helps you to generate the income that allows you to say, I can take a week to go spend time with my family. I can be present to meditate and become a better person. I can take time to exercise and gain more vitality for my spirit. So if you're going to live a perfect driven life, you need freedom from the daily distractions, minutia, and stress struggle bills that we all face. Your job or your clients uh, have, they, they come and go. So when you're able to create for yourself and generate income based on the experiences, the story that you've been through, then and only then do you have the freedom to pursue that who you really are. I'm going to bring that down to brass tacks and say this applies whether you are an entrepreneur or whether you are an employee, whether you're leading your company or leading a team. What I, that's what I'm getting is that this applies no matter where you are or even what you aspire to. The yes. value is here to, uh, to understand your why and your story. Yes. So cool. While it says digital assets, it's really about finding the assets in your story. Mm, powerful. Cool. All right. So we got that covered. Shadid, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to be part of our unfolding story here on the Teen Suicide Prevention Society and on the Suicide Prevention Show. What I want to say is that your ability to put complex concepts into simple, understandable steps is beautiful and much appreciated. So thank you very much for bringing your wisdom to us today. Oh, it was my pleasure to share this time and space with you and your audience.